I'm going to go ahead and get started. My name is Heather George. I've got my colleague Stephanie Martinez. We're going to be presenting to you about how you include your students with disabilities within your Tier 1 supports. Um, like I talked about this morning, all means all. And so we're going to look at how we can make sure that we are being very mindful and purposeful to make sure that we are addressing all of our students within our Tier 1 plan. Um, on our student campuses. So what we're going to be covering today is uh, making sure that there's clear understanding about the basic mechanics of school-wide PBIS and how they have an impact on overall student behavior, as well as learning about strategies and tools that are available that you guys can use that to use um, to assess how you're including your students with disabilities within your Tier 1 system, but also for you to be able to start to develop an initial plan. So there's two different handouts um, that have been uploaded to the app, which I'm not sure if you had a chance to look at, but we did not change any of the slides since it's been uploaded. So the slides are the, still the same, and the action plan is a separate document that hopefully is there. If it's not, let us know, and um, we'll make sure that it gets up there. But we had set it up so that you'll be able to start inputting and writing information on there um, so that you can take your action plan back to your school. And as a reminder, considering these four questions overall, knowing everybody's in a different place of implementation. So some of us have been implementing PB or Tier 1 for quite some time and may have gone in the advanced tier. Some of us may have been implementing for quite some time, but feels like things have dropped a bit. And some of us might be trying to get things going. So knowing that everybody's in a different place, but thinking about what is it that you're hoping to gain during this session? What did you learn in this session? And what will I do with what I've learned? Um, so I'm curious to hear a little bit about you guys. Um, where does your school fit? We have school-wide PBIS, but our students with disabilities are not included. Who feels comfortable raising their hand if that fits for you? And just know that those of you in the audience are not being recorded at this time, so you're good. Your secret's good with me, all right? Uh, so we have school-wide PBIS, and all students are included in what we do. Okay, great. I'm not used to the animation here. All right, so let's think about how we can transform. And ideally, let's go back to this. We do want to make sure that all of our students are included. And we need to make sure, like, what do we need to put into place these mechanics so that they are? Because it's also going to require our conversations with our adults, who are particularly who may be interacting with our students with disabilities, so that they have full access to our Tier 1 system. So let's think about how can we transform our learning environment so that students can learn better? So I want you to think about that. What can you do on your school campuses so that students can learn better? What can we do to help our teachers teach more effectively? And to have our schools become spaces that intentionally are developing that whole child. So there's a lot of pieces involved with that piece. Because the thing is, all of our students need cognitive abilities, they all need social competence, and they all need emotional well-being. Our adults need that too. So think about that's that piece of that whole child and how we're addressing. Winston Churchill did not create this, but he did say, we shape our buildings thereafter they shape us. And to think about how are you shaping your building on your school campus? Because remember, all students are part of that school campus. And that create, helps to create, when we set up a um, clear, common experiences. There's a clear, common language with the, that we're using across campus, and it's guided by these common vision and values that your team has been established. That starts to create an effective organization because you've got that clear vision that's driving everything. Um, but what it takes is some quality leadership in order to get that done. And that sometimes can be a tricky piece because we've got lots of variation in leaders. But if we can remember these components of what is it that we all want to have at our school campus. What is it that we all value? And that helps to create that vision, which then can help you start to create what are our expectations across our campus, which would be your common language that you're using, and that's then the practice is how are people experiencing, and not just the kids, but the adults as they're interacting um, with each other across campus. So just as a quick reminder, um, for those of you with PBIS, is we're, the whole goal is to build an effective environment that's conducive to learning so that all kids can be the most successful. So we've got to think about like working with an individual kid in many ways is a piece of cake. 
we're talking about the whole environment. That's a different um, and bigger beast to, to address. But the goal is we want positive behavior to be much more effective than problem behavior. But we've got to have a team of folks to work together, collaborate. We've got to use data to make our decisions and be able to come up with um, effective interventions based on that. And then the goal is to set up the environment so we can prevent as much problem behavior from occurring, teach what we want to see differently, respond differently to problem behavior, um, so that we can have some changes within the overall outcomes of our students. Question for you is how many of you are coming from the school setting? Raise your hand. That's what I figured. How many, though, are from the district? Okay, good. So we've got some district folks because the district folks, obviously, you're supporting the schools. And so, again, everybody's going to benefit um, from all this information. So we'll make sure that we're constantly talking to both groups because both can be impacted. So. I think the tricky part about when we talk about tier one is we do say that there's at least 80% of our kids that are responding um, well to your tier one PBIS on campus. And sometimes that accidentally gets um, understood as it's only going to teach 80% of kids on campus. We're only going to work with 80% of kids on campus. And that's actually not what it's saying. So the part that I like about this visual is what it's saying is tier one means everybody. Everybody has access to tier one. When you have school-wide expectations, everybody is involved in that process um, overall. But we do know that 80% of kids are going to do, if you implement with fidelity, are going to do probably just fine. They don't need anything more than that. But when we're talking about tier two, it's supplemental. It's sitting on top of tier one. So again, we know that there's going to be some kids, maybe about 20% that need a little bit more. But what are we going to do in addition to what they're already accessing for tier one? That's the big piece, as opposed to what are we going to do instead of. Um, so this, that's the part that I love. I'm a visual person, and I love that it's like, oh, OK, this is a layered approach. And the more that you move up the continuum and provide more intensive interventions, um, the more instructional minutes that you're talking about adding to address um, the problem area. All right, so who's school-wide PBIS meant for? Raise your hand, and again, you're not on video for this. Only students without IEPs. Only students who do not receive additional services. And only students who display the behavioral expectations. Good job so far. It's meant for everybody. Yes, I figured you guys knew that. So um, again, students with disabilities are often not uh, accessing our universal supports. So we've got to think about how can we bring them into the mix. And so what Stephanie and I are going to do for you guys this morning is talk about the critical elements around Tier 1 um, PBIS and then bring into how we're going to specifically access supports for students with disabilities as we're rolling out and trying to implement Tier 1 with fidelity according to these critical elements. So these are 10 of the main critical elements that are set up around the benchmarks of quality. They're embedded across um, the TFI. In, in some slightly different um, subtitles, but we're going to go through these various sections and talk specifically. This action plan handout that you're seeing right here, that is that extra handout that I was talking to you guys about that will allow you, based on each section that we're going through of the critical elements, it'll give you some ideas and considerations for how you can include kids with disabilities related to that critical element. And it allows for you to jot down some notes so how you can action plan and take it back to um, your school for what you can do next. And there's also, of course, um, the worksheet in the back of your uh, paper agenda of your planner has some information in there, too. All right, so let's talk quick, uh, quickly about the team. So that's that school-based problem-solving team. And essentially, that multidisciplinary team is made up of um, multiple stakeholders. They're reviewing that tier one data that you've got on campus for the behavior and academics. Uh, that team that might be a subgroup of the school leadership team. Your team actually could be comprised of two different teams where you've got folks dealing with the academic piece and you've got folks dealing with the behavior and you've figured out a system of how you're going to crosswalk to make sure, because some students may be having struggling in both areas. 
but essentially their responsibilities on that team are to develop that core curriculum for behavior. So they're designing and overseeing that tier one process. There's ongoing evaluation and progress monitoring, and we're training in, um, everybody, all of our stakeholders, our faculty, our students, as well as um, our teachers across campus. How many of you are on your tier one team on your school campus now? Okay, does this fit what you guys are, are doing? I know there's a lot probably missing of the other stuff that you do, right? Yeah, so, but those are your primary responsibilities as a PBIS team member. And there's, like I said, no right way on whether there should be one team that's dealing with both academics and behavior or there are two teams that are split up or that they've integrated. The key is, are you using data? Are you meeting as a team? And are you able to get through, identify the problems and come up with the interventions? Uh, matched that. So here's an example of just various folks on that team. So I want you to think about what you have for uh, special education supports for your students on your campuses. Who are those people and what are the functions that they're providing on your school campus? And I think probably listing out and getting an idea who are all of these people. And it's very possible that you may have people that you had no idea <laughs> come on campus and what they're providing. But this will help give you a, a good idea of the folks that we need to integrate um, into this process to make sure that they're equally included in the implementation of Tier 1. So think about, do you have clear representation of special education on your Tier 1 team? And do any of you have that now, would you say? You've got clear representation? OK, good. Is there a voice for the team for students with disabilities? Okay, we've got one person with that. And then how does the team communicate with all the special education providers? Okay, so if I could ask you really quickly, how do you guys communicate and make sure the word gets out to the rest of them? Okay. Okay, and I'm going to repeat this, what, what you can't hear in the back, so. Okay, so your function is already the special education coordinator, so usually that means you've got to be key communicator, right? Yeah, so. Um, so already you had that down no matter what. So I think that's something to think about is like who's that lead person and is that person clearly communicating to the rest of the folks. Doesn't mean that everybody has to go to the team meeting, okay? But the mean, it means it's got to be clear if you're at that meeting, what's your function for being there around that table that you're contributing to that team. But if you're not at that meeting, you still are an integral part of that tier one process. How are we getting the word out? No different than the rest of our teachers that may not be on that tier one team you know, the general education teachers, how are we getting the word out to them so that we truly are implementing PBIS um, in the classroom? Thank you for that. So where does your school stand? We do not have a PBIS team. Is anyone in that category? Okay. We have a PBIS team, but no representation from special ed. Okay. That's why we have an action plan going for today. And we have a team, and special ed is represented, which must be said that, great. So what I want you to do is, is just to give you a little heads up of how to use that action plan um, that we've designed for you guys. Some of the guiding questions for you guys to think about in how you can improve your tier one team for teaming and addressing um, students with disabilities is does the school need to add representation from the special ed team? And think about that, because if it does, then you're going to want to figure out who those people are, why we want to include them, and help to give them a role on that team. How we provide communication and training to the staff to provide special education services um, and the itinerant um, staff as well. How are we going to get input from our staff who provide special education services or who may be itinerant, as well as our students with disabilities, including it in our team's mission and our goal statement. Because remember, Tier 1, that means all. And so these are just some guiding questions to help you guys think about when you're looking at how to impact that teaming aspect of it, of what you can um, list on your action plan. 
So Stephanie's going to start getting into the expectations and rules, and then specifically what that means you guys could do um, and to add to your action plan. Okay, let, me let me see if this, okay, this does pick up. Um, so I'm going to hold it just it doesn't flop over. Um, but I'm guessing a lot of you are here because you want to see examples, right, of what this actually looks like if we have a lot of school folks. And so what we're going to get in here is a lot of different examples of what some of our schools have done. And so you probably all have school-wide expectations already, right? The question is when you develop those and you put those in place, did you have all students in mind when you developed those expectations? And it doesn't match the culture of your school. Another big piece of it is, as Heather was saying, you know, we have these school-wide uh, uh, school expectations, and there's some examples at the top. We want to make sure that all of our support staff know what those are. And so at least in the state of Florida, we have behavior analysts, school psychologists, social workers who may serve up to eight different schools. And because the schools have their own different expectations, when they're going to the different schools, I don't know about you, but I don't think I could remember eight different set of school-wide expectations. So how can we get that resource for them? Um, it's not in here, but I'll give you an example. We have um, one district, it's a district coordinator, and she said, I go into 20-something schools, I can't remember all the school-wide expectations. So she actually took, it was like a rubber stringy thing, I don't even know what you call it, but she wrote out all the expectations for each school, she laminated them, and then clipped them on to this wristband thing, so every time she would go out to a school, she would just go to the wristband and see, okay, what are the school-wide expectations for this school? And that would be a great thing for some of our support staff to do. Um, I'm working with a district and the behavior analysts have like, you know, 12 schools each and they're really trying to get and support PBIS when they're working with the students. They're like, but we can't remember those. So it's a great way to get the support staff who are going to different schools to understand it. So again, here's just a definition of that. Um, so here's a typical, what we see in Florida, um, some school expectations of being safe, being respectful, and being responsible, and it kind of stops there. So here's one that uh, being inclusive could be another one if you're talking about making sure that we're including all students, because when the expectations aren't just aren't for our students, but it's also for our staff as well, so that would be a good way to do it. Um, we were working with a high school once and they wanted to, to be tolerant, like let's be tolerant of others. And then they started having a huge debate about, it's not just to be about tolerant of people, but we want to be accepting of others with differences. So they switched that around and defined what that looked like. So when we think about, we have these school -wide expectations, we have them in posters all over our schools, then we start to look at can all of our students access it? Yeah, there's a nice poster on the wall, but can all of our students read those? Um, if we have a unit on our campus for students who use sign language, and that's what they use, can they read that? Do we have little guys or even older students who don't read on our campus? Can they access what those posters say? So some different considerations on there. Um, maybe they need more examples and non-examples. How many of you guys have students that use some sort of assistive technology device? on campus, okay? Are those expectations included on there so they can use that language? Whether it's the students using the language or the staff using the language. Maybe we need to think about including in there not only the expectations, but also the rules for specific settings. So when the kids are out in different settings using that assistive technology device, they have that ability to use that. Um, so here's just a couple different examples of doing that. This was one school, this was their traditional expectations, but they really defined what that looked like because we can have something like self-control, but what does that actually mean? So they have very concrete examples on there for their students, so they know. Um, and then we think about rules for specific settings. How many of you guys have developed rules for like the hallway, right? Cafeteria, bus area? But do we do it for all settings on campus? So when we think about students with disabilities, you may have a small um, population of students, but do they go to things like therapy rooms? Do they have OT? Do they have PT? Do they have speech? Have we developed rules for those settings that go back to the expectations and have we taught it to the students? And so um, here's a couple of different examples. This was one school had a lot of students who had very intensive needs, a lot of non-readers, and so they made sure that depending upon what was going on, they had the school-wide expectations, and then they used these graphics, and these were also the graphics that were on the assistive technology device, so they matched for the kids. 
And then based on what was going on, based on their data, they would change those graphics if there was different behaviors that they needed to address that were not up there as their examples. Um, this is a school um, that went back and looked at, and they had their traditional, and I know it's hard to read, they had their traditional expectations aligned with rules for classroom and cafeteria, bus and outside, but they also said, you know what, we have a therapy room or we have therapy sessions that our students need to go to, so we really need to align rules and expectations to those therapy sessions. They also have a sensory room. And so that was another setting that they said, we don't have expectations and rules for those. So they had to come up with for those. And again, just to make sure that everybody could access it, they have the visuals that went along with those. Then the next part is making sure that we can teach it to the students. And so when we talk about teaching our um, expectations and rules for our students, we want to make sure students are always included. So hopefully this will work, but we have three different um, videos that show a variety of ways that where students are involved and developing and teaching the expectations and rules, but also being taught. So here's the first one. Hold on. I'm Scott Kozlowski. I'm the um, behavior specialist and uh, PBS coach at Naples High School. This is one of our bulletin boards. Okay. I have an old computer, so let me... Yeah, I've got to extend, sorry, the... Okay. And I think it's now frozen. Oh. Attempt number two. I'm Scott Kozlowski. I'm the um, behavior specialist and uh, PBS coach at Naples High School. This is one of our bulletin boards. They have a bulletin board contest each year right before ninth grade open house. And this year they did the theme of pro, which is be prepared, respectful on time. And um, each classroom or classroom got to sign up for bulletin boards. And this is one of them that they've done. This is the bulletin board that won. This was done by one of our autism classrooms. And they are winning. $50 to use towards our program. Take a bite into pro. Scott, how do you think this helps the students understand pro? Well, just being visible, um, it shows the expectations that we expect from all students and staff, and it just being visible keeps it in their mind of how they should be behaved in school. Hey, um, my name is Mary Blackman. I'm the dean at Naples High School, and we did a bulletin board contest on campus, inviting clubs to take on one of our mini bulletin boards that we have and base their theme around the pro concept and whatever other idea they wanted to include. There was a, money, a prize for the winner, that, and all the monies would be put into the clubs to be used by the clubs for anything that they might need. Okay, so for that one, you can see each individual club or classroom got to participate, and one of the winners was their self-contained classroom for students with autism. So they were actively involved with that poster competition. Then another one. So the Culture Club was formed more to kind of create a positive uh, environment. I think PBS is like basically the way the people, the way the staff and the students show positive behavior and, and just general, right? It's the way they, it's the way they know. It's the way that makes them understand. It's mainly students, right? The fact that what positive behavior is, what it means, um, how to act around people. Well. It's a positive way to get kids to behave more. I think it's definitely been a, a, a an improvement to the school. It um, gives them an incentive to act good no matter where you are. Uh, oh, respect me being positive to everyone. Um, paying attention, being nice, courteous, giving them manners. It means 
for students to do things that are good for other people, support, good for themselves, positive behaviors, all the good things that they can do to help other people. PBS, in my opinion, means that this school is going positive. You want everyone to be positive. You want everyone to do things that are positive. Motivation. Just being positive. So that was from the Florida School for the Deaf and Blind. And so they went to the students and they wanted feedback from them. We're doing this PBS. What does this mean to you? What does it look like? What do you think about it? And so they went to the students and got them to give that feedback. And then the last one. Try this again. And I want to show this one because it's not on um, the PowerPoint. I'm scared. What are you going to say? I'm being ignored. It will make me not talk to anybody no more. These are real people with real emotions facing real discrimination. They're hurt when you ignore them, stare at them, or treat them differently, just like anybody else would be. A simple hi can turn a whole day around. I would want them to say hi. It makes me happy. Don't look away and stray. Stop by and say hey. So that was a high school, and it was identified that the students with disabilities were not feeling that the school was inclusive and the students were not included. And so they came up with the idea that they wanted to develop that video as a public service announcement. Okay, so those are just a couple of the examples. Then when we think about it too, one of the things that we provide to schools when they go through training is how to develop their classroom management system aligned back to PBIS. So here's just a sem uh, sample of that. And so a lot of times our, our general ed teachers do that, but we also want all of our staff to do that, whether it's a special ed teacher in an inclusion setting, they have their own classroom, or if I'm the speech and language therapist, how can I have my stuff aligned back to the school-wide expectations? So there's that consistency across those. Um, as Heather said, here's just some guiding questions that we came up with that's on the action plan. So just some things for you to consider and think about that maybe you haven't before. You may have all of these or you say, oh, this is one that we really don't have. We haven't thought about um, reading level or assistive technology or some of our support staff making sure that everything they're doing is aligned back to the school-wide expectations and rules. So then the next one we um, talk about is the reward and recognition system. Um, this is just a slide that we use to remind people why we're doing that reinforcement system um, because there's got to be a rationale and reason behind it. This is one of the pushbacks we kind of get, but it's about rewarding that appropriate behavior. And so I don't know if you guys ever have this, but we have sometimes say, well, I can't reward Johnny because he never makes good choices. And so when we think about some of our students with disabilities, it makes it sometimes hard for some of our staff to feel that they deserve it and they need it, but they should have access to it just like everybody else because they do make good choices and it's catching them when they do. So then we talk about everybody should earn it. Um, and I just want to point out here too, I know we're talking a lot about students, but also thinking about our staff. And so when we think about those itinerant staff, if I go back to the schools where our social workers or our school psychologists, behavior analysts serve multiple schools, we want to think about two things. One, that when they're on our campuses, they have the ability to reward students that they work with or that they see on campus. But also, if we have some sort of staff recognition program, that we include them as well with that system. Um, so it's not just our teachers that are there all the time. Um, I think we sometimes forget about our instructional assistants as well and making sure they have access to that. So when we think about including our students um, in our reward systems, there's whole different types. We've got independent versus group rewards, sometimes short time versus long term rewards, and then who provides it. So here's some just different examples. And just making sure that if we're putting things in place that our kids with disabilities actually find these things motivating or rewarding. Um, I just think, for example, if we have a student who has dietary needs, and I know that's becoming more and more common, and you have a school that's like, okay, we're going to do an ice cream social. Well, can all students 
access that ice cream social? Do you have non-dairy things? Do you have the, uh, items that the students can physically eat if need be? Um, so are these things all available? If we're gonna have a dance, can all of our students access that dance? Or if we're gonna, we have lots of schools say, well, we'll do like a staff student kickball game. Well, do you have it adapted in some way that if you have students that need those adaptions, they can participate in those as well? Um, the other thing I was gonna say is that we've had some schools, especially, are any of you guys here in middle of high school? Yeah, okay, so we've had some middle schools and high schools that like to do like competitions, grade level competitions, and the grade level that says um, has the best attendance or um, goes the longest time without a referral for specific behaviors gets a reward. And so we had one high school we were working with that had that set up. And so they had to go so many days without specific types of rewards and then the school got a reward. Well, they also had a couple of kids with disabilities who had some issues with anger management and self-control and they got in a fight twice in the cafeteria which then took that reward away. And then they had this huge debate, well, you know, it's the kids with the disabilities and so should that affect the whole school? And they ultimately said yes, because we're saying this is whole school. So then what they had to think about were what were some short-term rewards they could for the do the students outside to work towards that whole school reward. And so they had to make some modifications there. Um, so here's just some different considerations that sometimes our students with their disabilities might need to be rewarded more frequently. And how can we build that into our school-wide system? Um, we've had some schools who are like, we'll do a school store once a month. Can our students wait a whole entire month to go to that school store, or do we need to do something small to work them up towards that? Um, finding out interests, I said that earlier. So there's lots of different things that we consider um, for our students. So again, here's just some different guiding questions that you can use to help you identify where you are in this process and maybe help you to identify some areas of need for um, making sure all of your students are included. This next one is um, what we like to call effective responses to problem behavior. In Florida, we've defined it as the four different parts, defining behaviors, how we respond, our forms and data collection, and then a clear office um, process. So we also look at, this is the first part of defining it, what's a teacher-managed behavior versus an office-managed behavior, and what is a crisis situation. How many of you guys have done that on your campus? Okay. So sometimes we may need to look at some different considerations for our students with disabilities. So what is the definition that we use for something like disrespect, defiance, classroom disruption? And how do our students fit in with those definitions and what's considered an office managed and what's considered a teacher managed? Um, we also need to think about how that impacts our students with disabilities. Are we defining something in such a way that our students with disabilities might get referrals more frequently because of the definition and not thinking about what their actual disability is and how we can make some teaching efforts to change their behavior so that they don't get lots of referrals. Um, and then another one is getting um, input from our students and families around what those definitions look like and how it may have an impact on their child. Then when we think about our effective discipline process, it includes all these different things on here. As Heather said, I, I'm a visual person too, so I'll show the visual one there. So when we think about it, this is our a referral process for a school that we worked with. So this is what a teacher does if it's a classroom managed behavior and this is the steps that you take. In the middle, it defines what's teacher managed, what's office managed, and down on the right hand side, that's the process of what we do if a student's behavior is observed and they need to go to the office. Well, I taught a self-contained unit for students with disabilities um, that had behavioral issues, and so I look at some of these things and I'm like, you know, my kids use profanity. So when I look at that and I see the profanity, most teachers would be like, you're out of the door, you're going to the office. And if I did that every single time one of my students used a profanity, they'd be in the office all the time. So I have to think about, okay, within the context of my school and this flow chart, I want to have some consistency, but I also need to consider that we're teaching replacement words and behaviors. So when do they go to the office for profanity when they don't, if I was using this flow chart? And thinking about crisis situations. And um, we find a lot of our tombs, our schools have this on here, but they forget the crisis piece. So what do we do when it's a crisis situation? How do we define it? Um, and what does that look like? And what we find sometimes too, even though this is a school-wide plan, sometimes those crisis 
plans are unique to the individual students and the students and their needs. So somewhere putting in there if there's a unique plan, how to find out what it is and implement it. So here's just some ways that might look different for students with a disability. So if we think about Jerry, Jerry's a student. On his IEP, it says he needs to use appropriate language to handle his anger. So we're working on that. That is one of his goals. Well, how does that fit in with that, that flow chart that I just showed you? When does he go to the office? When does he not go to the office? That's one of the goals we're working on. Um, Linda has on a goal to, to use communication device to respond to her teacher as opposed to yelling the teacher's name out. Miss, 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 miss. Well, at some point that might be considered classroom disruption, but remember that's the goal in our IEP, and so we're trying to redirect her to using her communication device. And so here's just a couple other examples. You guys can probably think of your own for your own students, but really thinking about what does their IEP say, but also thinking about within a school-wide system, students who have a behavior intervention plan, and how does that fit within whatever's in place on your campus. And so this is just another example. So just remembering that sometimes with our students with disabilities, their behavior based on what their IEP is and their disability may not always fit perfectly in that beautiful flow chart. So working with your teachers and your staff members that serve students with disabilities and have them say, okay, how does this work for them? Um, especially if you have a large population and maybe you have a unit of kids, how does that work for them? Where do they fit into that process? Um, so just some other considerations for responding to, to problem behavior. You know, we have the different classroom management strategies, but if a student does have that individual behavior plan, that behavior support plan, going back and using that and making sure that we're implementing that with fidelity, and if not, do we need to go back and revise it? Um, thinking about IDA regulations um, and then functions of behavior, you've got all that on there. Again, just some guiding questions for you um, for what should we do. Um, go back and look at. So how many of you say, you know, we need to go back and look at our discipline process? I see a couple of nods. How many of you say we need to go back and look at how we're defining the problem behaviors? Oh, I see more on that one. And that's probably a more common one that we think of. So this one is just teaching. So reasons to teach. Um, you guys know this. This is just a great selling point for staff who don't and reminding our, our staff that sometimes it's a skill deficit. The student doesn't know. How many of you guys have a high mobility population where kids are coming in and out throughout the year? A couple of you. How many of you guys work with alternative schools? A couple. We have to remember those kids are coming from somewhere else where they've been taught this is how we behave at this school and now they're at your school and they need to be taught what does that look like. So when we have those high mobility, maybe it is a skill deficit because they don't know at your specific school site what those expectations are and what those rules are for those settings. Um, and then there's also the performance deficit. So they, we hear this a lot, well, Johnny has the skill, but he's choosing not to use it. So let's go back to why is he choosing not to use the skill that he has. Um, maybe it's the staff member, maybe it's the setting. So looking at that and realizing that maybe it's we need to take Johnny to that specific setting because talking to Johnny in the classroom about the cafeteria, he actually needs to go down to that cafeteria and experience what it looks like in the cafeteria for him to make those connections. Um, so I, I can tell you I had a classroom one year and we were in the media center because that's where they put us, and there was a ramp that led up to my classroom. And so the kids loved it because they, they were middle school, mainly boys, and so they would sit on the railing and slide down. But that's not safe. And, and how many times did I tell them, you know, you can't do that, you can't slide down, it, you're going to get hurt, it's not running up and down. And finally I'm like, okay, talking to them is not enough. So I did what we called a field trip. And they were so excited we were going on a field trip. And we lined up the door and I said, okay, now we're going to go and we're going to practice walking up and down the ramp. And they said, okay. And they got to the bottom and they said, where are we going now? And I said, we're practicing going up the ramp. They're like, miss, we said this was a field trip. Yes, we're leaving the classroom, we're going on a field, we're walking up and down. They didn't make those connections. I could talk to them all I wanted until we actually took them outside and walked up and down that ramp. Um, and we just did that for a couple minutes one day until they could do it correct, because after the first time they thought it was funny and they, one would purposely try to run up or down. And 
but it was that practice that they needed in that specific setting. And so we didn't have issues for a while, and then when they would start to have issues again, we'd go out and practice the specific skill in that setting. Um, so here's another one. How many of you guys have heard of Harry Wong? He's been around for a long time. This comes from him. That in order to learn a new behavior, on average, it takes us eight times. And that's average. Some of our kids will take longer. So when you have a, someone who said, well, I told, I always pick on Johnny. I told Johnny yesterday, well, Johnny probably needs to hear it one more time. He needs to practice the skill one more time. Because on, on average, it takes most people eight, but Johnny might need a little bit more work. Um, and then also, if Johnny's learned it the wrong way, then he needs to correct and practice it the right way. On average, probably 28 or more times to learn the correct way if he had it wrong the first way. So here are some different considerations when we think about teaching those expectations and rules. But now we also need to think about the social emotional learning for our students and thinking about that. Um, how many of you have students that have social skills written on their IEP that they're going to re receive social skills? Okay, I see a couple people like that. So what is that social skill they're being taught? Is there consistency? Is it an evidence-based program? Is it something that is being taught for our students with disabilities that maybe all of our students at our school would benefit? And so we can include the students in there as well. Um, making sure whatever's being taught in that social skills is also written as their social emotional goals on their IEP. So here is an example. We give them, um, schools who come through our tier one training, a lesson plan template to use. And so here's a lesson plan template, but there's some things that need to be added. Thinking about universal design for learning. So when we set the lesson plan up front, are we doing those things? maybe what accommodations or modifications students may need to access that lesson plan. And then what I mentioned earlier, what about the assistive, assistive technology piece? Are we incorporated in there if we have a student that has a device and making sure whatever's in the lesson, those examples and non-examples are built into that technology device. And then just some more reteaching that might be needed. Um, and then just maybe making those connections for students between what's being taught here and the goals that are on their IEP. So again, here's just some different suggestions um, for what we could do as well. Classroom systems. And so when we look at classroom systems, um, things that need to be in place that sometimes we take for granted. So just making sure that our students with disabilities, with whatever classroom setting they're in, they have these five different things that are being implemented in those. And so if you want some more information, there's the link there you can go to. So just making sure that we have some prevention strategies in place. So looking at the function of the behavior for the student and saying, you know, every time Heather comes in here, she just does not do well with math worksheets. So what are we going to do to try to prevent her from ripping up that math worksheet and telling me some inappropriate language to get out of that math task? So what can we do to prevent it? And so we provide some different strategies to think about. And then what are we teaching Heather so that she doesn't do that behavior? So we're teaching her replacement behavior. What does that replacement behavior look like? And here's some just different ways of doing that. And then how are we going to respond? So even though we have some prevention strategies in place and we've put them in place with Fidelity, we are teaching her replacement behavior instead of ripping up that math worksheet. But today she still did those things. How are we going to respond to it, keeping that function of behavior in mind so we don't reinforce her ripping up that paper and using that inappropriate language again? So we give some different recommendations. So we also want to think about, too, you know, those are the structures that we have in place, but what does that look like if we have a student who's pulled out in like a resource room or maybe they're in a self-contained classroom? We want to make sure those five elements of what a good structure of classroom management are in place in there as well. I think sometimes, oh, they're in a special ed classroom that's self-contained or a resource room. There's an assumption that those are things are in place and they may or may not be. So we want to have that consistency between the general ed and the special ed. So here's some different considerations. But also thinking about if we're starting to include our students with disabilities in a general ed classroom, are those structures in place and do students have access to them? So working with those teachers, um, making sure they know how to do UDL or they understand the accommodations or modifications for the students. So again, here's just some of those questions that you should ask. Go back to that action plan and maybe identify one or two things for your specific setting or 
whether it's a school or district, you might say, wow, as a district, these are some of the things that we need to do to make sure that our students with disabilities are being taught. And then the last one that I'm going to talk about is looking at data and evaluating. So how many of you guys look at your discipline data monthly? Okay. How many of you look at your discipline data and disaggregate it? So looking at by specific grade level, maybe by race, ethnicity, students with disabilities, students without disabilities. Okay, I saw fewer hands for that one, but some of you guys do that as well. And so that's what we're really looking at. Um, in Florida, we teach our schools to use a four-step problem-solving process within that data to make sure that we truly identify what's the problem, figure out why it's occurring, then matching our interventions to why we're having the problem, and then evaluating it. Um, this is really important, too, because we have a lot of times schools will say, you know, we had an increase in discipline referrals last year, or we're having an increase because we got a, a self-contained unit for students with emotional behavior disorders. You're like, oh, okay, well, let's go back and look at that. And then we actually go back and look at the discipline data, and you know what we find? Not always the case. So there's sometimes those assumptions that are made. So we really want schools to look at that to make sure that really is the problem. Um, we have lots of different data on here. BOQ, the BOQ, as, as it was joked about this morning, the benchmarks of quality, or the TFI, so diagnosing and identifying what specific things you need on place, so which elements you need to work on. Then we talk about progress monitoring. Here in Florida, we use the PIC or the PBS implementation checklist, which you guys might use the team implementation or the TIC. Um, other acronyms up there are ODRs. We call them Office Discipline Referrals in Florida, whatever you use, but that's to monitor throughout the year. And then looking at the outcomes at the end of the year. OSS is out of school suspension. ISS is in school suspension. And then the one that's SESIR is, in Florida, we call it the School Environmental Safety Indicator Reports. Those are the incidents that have to be reported to the Department of Ed. Things like tobacco, alcohol, drugs, firearms, weapons, and such. So we want to make sure that when we're looking at the data, we're breaking it down to see how are our students with disabilities included in all of this and using that to identify if there's a specific area that we need to work on to make sure that our students with disabilities are included. So when we talk about this, the first thing is how do we use our referral data? How many of you guys have like a teacher or a minor tracking form or pre-intervention or pre-referral form? Okay, um, most of you don't, but there's a few of you that do. But that's a great resource. So if you're using something like that and you do have a student that has repetitive behaviors, how are you using that form to pinpoint what to do with the student? So is it a specific time of day where the student's having issues? Um, is it every day at 2 o'clock we have a student that acts out and then we start looking at it and maybe it's an issue of this first grader had lunch at 9.30 in the morning, because we have some schools that do that, and it's now 2 o'clock, and I wonder why they're getting frustrated. They struggle with academics, it's reading time at the end of the day, and they're hungry too. So that can help us to problem solve and pinpoint some areas of need, and you can do the same, or you should do the same with office referrals. Another big push that we've had in the state of Florida, which you may have had, is looking at equity and discipline data. Research has shown by, by Ruski, but specifically around students by race and ethnicity, that even with PBS, schools will put play, things in place. They'll have reductions in their rates of office referrals and out of school suspension. But when they break it down by race and ethnicity, it is going down for everybody but a specific target group. And in this case, it's a lot of times our students that are black or African American. Yes, we had an overall decrease, but there's some disproportionality. So what we do is we kind of do the same thing by race and ethnicity, but we also look to see if there's equity and discipline for students with disabilities. So we have a, a statewide data system that our schools can enter in if they want to that gives them this data, but we've also developed this really cool tool. I won't take any credit for it called the equity tool, and it breaks the discipline data down by race and ethnicity, but there's also a tab offered there for students with disabilities. And so what this does is it looks like a different metrics for, for disproportionality. So these are just a couple of them. Um, so SWD is students with disabilities. The first column shows the percent of students enrolled. So at this specific school, about 20% of the entire student population are students with disabilities. The next column is student composition. So 20% of student enrollment are students with disabilities, 
but about 30% of their referrals are coming from students with disabilities. So you can see there's a gap. There should be about 20% of the kids with disabilities should be getting the referrals because that's 20% of their enrollment. There's something called the E formula. How many of you guys remember the bell curve? Remember the bell curve? And then if you're bringing out, okay. The E formula is essentially a bell curve. Once you get past one standard deviation, if it is extreme disproportionality, this little grid highlights pink to say yes, there's disproportionality. Because even though it's 19.6% enrollment, we're never gonna have it exactly 19.6%, so there's a little leeway. So at 29%, it indicates that there is some disproportionality for students. And then risk ratio. How many of you guys have ever looked at risk ratio before? Okay, one person, okay. So risk ratio is how likely is that subgroup to get a referral, so the students with disabilities are 1.68 times more likely to get a referral than all other students at the school. So it indicating that there is some disproportionality. And then the risk column looks at the number of students that are enrolled for students with disabilities, how many of those have gotten referrals. So of all the students with disabilities at the school, 34% of all students with a disability have received a referral at this school. That's a huge population. So if we go back to Heather's you know, tattoo triangle that we're supposed to have, um, and if you did the, the whole 80, 15, 5, that's really indicating that there's a big issue for students with disabilities at this school. More than them are getting referrals. So all four of these metrics together indicate, or actually three metrics compared to student enrollment, the three metrics do indicate that there is some disproportionality for students with disabilities around office discipline referrals. The tool itself has lots of other uh, metrics on there. I just pulled the three up. It does it for office discipline referrals and out of school suspension. So if you're concerned about out of school suspension, it gives you that as well. This is the cool graph that our, our statewide database will do for the schools that do have access to it. And so it does that comparison as well. For risk, risk ratio, it does office discipline referrals, in school suspension, and out of school suspension. And it does it by race and ethnicity, but it also does for students with disabilities, or in Florida, they call it ESC for exceptional student education. And here's a way to kind of interpret that risk ratio. Um, and this is based on the guidelines that our Florida Department of Education, um, Bureau of Exceptional Education Student Services monitors districts. So this is just the guidelines for ours. One of the things that you sometimes do if you end up do seeing a risk ratio that's really, really high. So for example, we have some schools who freak out. They're like, we have a 25.2 risk ratio. How is that possible? That's impossible. You go back and you look at it, and sometimes it's enrollment for students that are Hawaiian Pacific Islander. There's not many students in Florida that are Hawaiian Pacific Islander. There may be one student at that school, and that one student's got a referral, so it's really, really high. So if you work at a school and you have a small population, whether it's race and ethnicity or students with disabilities, and you see a really high number, go back and look and see how many students are enrolled and the chances are that it's got less than 10 students. So here's just some different issues to think about with students with disabilities. Um, show of hands, uh, finger number one, if you say we probably have our students disproportionate for office referrals. Two, if you think we probably have some disproportionality around um, out of school suspension. Or three, if you think you have both. So I see some threes, I see some twos, okay. So this is a great tool, it's a resource, it's on our website. If you can't find it, there's a little search feature on the homepage, you just put equity on there and it should bring up the equity tool, but if not, we can, you can email us and we can get it too if that's something you wanna look at. So the, the big piece here is when we think about discipline and we think about just in general, either with our students with or without disabilities, we wanna have these three things in place. One, we wanna to try to prevent it from happening in the first place. Prevention is the best tool, because if we can prevent it, then we can continue to teach and move forward. Okay, that's just not me, right? It's kind of flicking. Um, and then we want to figure out ways to respond to it, and that response does include that crisis situation. So with whatever you use, um, a lot of the schools in Florida use CPI as a verbal de-escalation um, technique. And then the last one is that follow-up piece. And so, with that one, what we talk about with follow-up is once there's an incident that has occurred, how do we bring the student back into that school or that classroom and make them 
have a plan set in place so they're accepted and they start with a clean and fresh start. Um, and sometimes that's missing. So like if our student with a disability, let's say, is suspended for three days, when they come back to school, what plan do we have in place to make sure that same behavior doesn't happen again so they don't get suspended again? Or a big one is if they're in an alternative school and they come back from the alternative school, what supports or plan we're gonna put in place so that we make them successful back at their home school so they don't have to go back to the alternative school for the same repetitive behaviors. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Heather. Thank you, thanks for the prompt. All right, so winding it down, we'll talk about involving our stakeholders. And with involving our stakeholders, this is essentially dealing with um, a combination of things of do you have administrator support, do you have the faculty commitment, that's that faculty buy-in piece, as well as that family engagement piece. So there's kind of three different components, because as I talked about this morning, your stakeholders are not just your families. Your stakeholders are not just your teachers, but it's also the administrators, it's your community partners, it's, um, it's everybody else that you're interacting with, your staff, and we've got to remember how do we include all of our staff members that are working on our school campuses. So some of the things that we think about like we would typically do um, for just stakeholder commitment and getting overall buy-in is that we've got to make sure that that administrator we know we do best when we've got really strong leadership. And so are those administrators, you know, forming, are they modeling great leadership or at least even effective leadership or even support for PBIS? Um, sometimes we'll have to lower the bar. We're like, can you just say PBIS a few times or can you just give us a minute on the faculty agenda that starts to help to invoke that it's a priority within our campus. And then as we get more used to them seeing the actual impact, changes that are happening on campus, the use of data, we tend to see those numbers of minutes tend to increase at those faculty meetings. But we've got to have a clear vision of, of why we're doing what we're doing. And when we think about getting other people on board, um, you know, this might be different for some of our folks, our special ed providers that are coming in, because oftentimes they may be of, um, viewed as they're the resource folk. You know, you're the su support person that comes in, but you're not the true integral part of the school building, which is not accurate whatsoever because everybody's working together in this team collaborative process. So we've got to think about, they may not be used to being brought to um, the table. We've had bus drivers, for example, completely separate group of folks who've been brought to the table and the bus drivers were like, why are you wanting us to sit on your school team? We just drive the buses. It's like, well, most of our referrals are actually coming from the school buses, so we thought it might be good to have your input and for you to know what we're trying to do and how can we problem solve this together. So folks may not be used to being invited as part of this process, so we've got to remember that and give them a clear vision of why we want them involved in this process because, again, if we're just telling them what they're supposed to do, some people are good with it and they're tired and they're like, fine, I will comply and, and go along with it, but other folks, understandably, they need to have a reason and why they're doing what they're doing. And so we've got to be able to um, give them that compelling reason of why we're making that change in order to have that true ownership take place. Um, and we've got to teach and reward folks, even public acknowledgement, even letting them know um, how well they're doing things. You know, my 94-year-old grandmother said um, to me, gosh, it's really nice talking to you because you always say nice things to me and all I'm doing is just talking to you. And what I didn't realize is I'll be saying to her, oh, Grandma, that was really nice that you said that. Thanks for pushing the chair in. So, you know, I didn't trip over. It just, it's just habitual for me. But she goes, I've never had that in my 94 years. So whatever it takes, I'm gr the great-granddaughter. So uh, um, not the great-granddaughter, like the great, like all caps, great. So that's what that meant. No, just kidding. So ongoing commitment, again, we get back to that 80% again. So how do we at least keep, it doesn't mean only 80% of the folks that we're gonna be um, impacting, but it means our 80% of the folks actually implementing and knowing that we're gonna have to provide more advanced supports to some of our other um, folks on campus to get them on board and see why this is a good idea. And a lot of people's defense, there's been so many initiatives that may have come and gone that they're thinking, why should I spend all this effort and energy um, because something's going to be different next year. So trying to include them in all stages in the process, I think the more that folks are aware, even if you're not able to kick things off as quickly as you hope, let them know that. 
Otherwise, they'll start to think, yeah, I don't know what's happening. I heard everybody went to training, but I've never heard anything since then. We'll let them know, because we all sometimes go through um, a sluggish time on how we're implementing. But it keeps it up on the forefront. Um, and so we want to be able to have oh, those open conversations. So thinking about how to get your staff on board, we need to have those related services personnel. You know, much as like we talk about, it's good to have substitutes to be aware of your tier one system, because even if they're there short term, you want them to be able to implement and support the process on campus. Our, the same is true for all of our related services personnel. They are interacting with the students. They are part of your school community. Um, what's the support um, staff for the students with disabilities? For some of our, we may have some nursing supports. We need to include them and show them how PBIS is part of this um, process because the history may have been that, like I said, special ed was always um, dealt with separately or they just did their own thing. Um, so let's show everybody how the PBIS supports all and what truly all means and those that are working with our kids with disabilities so they can benefit too. When we're talking about training our stakeholders, the things that they need to be trained on are the things that everybody else is getting trained on. And we don't want to necessarily have a separate training. Let's just train everybody because they are part of the whole community. So folks need to know what's the overview of, of your tier one that you plan to roll out on campus. What are going to be the school-wide expectations? What does that look like and what does that mean and how are we going to teach that across campus? How are we going to acknowledge people when they're actually um, implementing it? And how are we going to respond a little differently? And what's the referral process now so that things can be a bit more organized on campus so we can use data for decision making? And the basic principles of behavior. Everybody can benefit on that. So what the students need, and again, this is regardless of ability, disability, all the students need to be trained on what the tier one expectations. Because all means all. They all need to be trained on what those rules look like in each particular setting. And how those trainings occurred may depend on what those students' abilities are. So it may be, obviously, that we've got to have maybe picture schedules that we're going through. We're doing a lot more repetitive training for things. Um, but the key is, is training occurring um, for all students. There's a reward system where we're acknowledging them, as well as there's discipline procedures, too. They need to be aware of it. But our families also need to know and be aware of it too. So we need to communicate with them what the tier one is. They need to know what PBIS is about, um, why the school chose to implement PBIS, um, how do schools actually implement it, and it probably also helps for them to know like what can the families expect to see. You may not know right away, and you could say you can expect to maybe see some change. We're hoping things will be more positive. We have less discipline issues, more instructional time that we can capitalize on. But as it becomes more evident as, as you're rolling things out on your campus, I think you can get more specific to, to your family members. But I think they also need to know, like, okay, why are you doing this? What kind of outcomes could we potentially expect? And then what can we do to get engaged? And I think that's the big piece. And sometimes you may not know exactly what they can do to get engaged. One of the big pieces to help get them engaged is to have them start to talk that common language at home. And they might need to be given some skills for that, some you know, scripts for that. So for example, if, we're, if you guys have be respectful on your school campus, let parents know, hey, how can you acknowledge your child for being respectful at home? Here's some ideas. Here's what it might look like, and here's what, how you can say it. And it starts to have that common language, common experience. Um, ways that we can get families involved. Sometimes there's a personal matrix that might be developed. Again, what would the behavior expectations? And so then if we're dealing with the bedroom, the kitchen, you know, the dining room area, what could that look like and help them develop that on how they can, um, what that would look like for their, their children at home. A parent letter that's developed giving them some background information. We've got um, test your knowledge, as some of our schools had developed, where it was um, for their parents to see how much they, they were understanding, and then having an overall parent overview and also a community involvement video. So I think it's important for parents to understand how their child might be impacted at Tier 1, um, regardless of, of their abilities. And so I think it's important to have those discussions and it also starts to open up if you've got children with disabilities, it starts to open up that relationship building on maybe they know their child, obviously they should know their child better, on what they may want to share of things that could potentially be rewarding for their child, especially if, if the children aren't um, able to verbalize that to us. 
explain how their child would be accessing the Tier 1 supports, sometimes related to what might be happening on campus that could be safety issues that we've got to be concerned with. Um, gain input from the families of what, um, how they think their child could access um, the supports and ask them for their input overall, like if you were talking about discipline procedures and that, that type of thing. There's no reason why parents of students with disabilities can't be equally involved as, as students, as parents with students without disabilities. We've also got to get the students on board too. So we need to find out from them what's motivating whether they have a disability or not, and talking to them about that, because they can come up with fantastic ideas that don't cost anything. And those are the things that you definitely want to be using. Um, get the students involved in teaching the expectations and rules. I've had um, one student in particular, uh, he had an IEP, he was very, very active, was spent a lot of time, unfortunately, in this in-school suspension room. Um, his requirement while he was in there, unfortunately, was to rewrite the student code of conduct, and he had fabulous handwriting, but he never imprinted any of the information whatsoever. We decided, though, to get him involved, and we needed him to collect data on the amount of horse playing that was occurring within transition time from class to class. Happened to be the number one thing that he always got in trouble for. So he would be horrified when he'd come to the school team meetings and report on it. And he's like, my gosh, these kids do not go from class to class. They're messing around. They're pulling stuff off the halls. They're in each other's space. Missing the fact he was always doing that, but now he has a clear role when he goes from class to class because he had to report back to the team. Got to be where there was some times where he wasn't coming to school. He would, um, a lot of truancy issues, but he loved going to the school team because he loved the attention. So what we said is, you know what, you have to come for five straight days in a row in order for you to attend the team meeting. That's your ticket in. And we need you to collect that data. And all of a sudden, he's like, he had a role. He was at school. He ended up graduating. So again, how can we bring them into this process? So, um, and he ended up being a great, great spokesmodel. And we were able to completely revamp the in-school suspension room based on his feedback on how well his handwriting was. And clearly, it wasn't having an impact on his behavior. Uh, so also thinking about how the students are getting involved, making them visible on campus. You know, there's ways that we've already done that on having student ambassadors, for example. But how can we also be um, much more explicit about that and having students provide examples and non-examples? So when you're getting to your action plan and you're thinking about how am I going to build the stakeholder involvement, here's some of the guiding questions. You know, how are you currently involving your staff from special ed in the development of your tier one system? It's that ownership piece. Um, how are we teaching everybody from special education about our tier one system? How are we currently involving our families with uh, students with disabilities in our tier one system and how can we include them? And how are we currently involving our students with disabilities in our tier one system and where and how can we include them in that process? So I'm hoping that that action plan, I double checked it while Stephanie was talking, it is up there um, for you to be able to download. And like I said, all the slides are here and I'm hoping that these guiding questions will assist you guys in, in some extra things. So it sounds like you're doing a lot of things already, but maybe you can be able to take it back and we always have room for improvement. Just to give you a heads up, there's an online PBS certificate for USF. Um, that goes through the continuum of support, so and folks can choose early childhood as well, but you learn um, all different ranges for individual student to school-wide to um, working with behavioral teams, and these, this is our contact information. So if you have any questions, we'll stay after and be ha happy to answer them. Otherwise, it is officially lunchtime. It's about five minutes before lunch is um, official, so hopefully you guys will get in the front of the line. So thank you.